Hey everyone, welcome to today's video. Today we want to continue our study on the steps to salvation. In our last video, we saw that our first work is to repent, and we learned that repentance is a godly sorrow for sin and a turning away from it in the heart. Well, today we want to look into what follows genuine repentance, and we want to begin by looking into the experience of David once more. In Psalms 38, we read of his sorrow. He says in verse 17, For I am ready to halt, and my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare my iniquity, I will be sorry for my sin. Now we already saw what that sorrow entailed in our previous video. And so today we want to focus on the first part of verse 18, where he says that he will declare his iniquity. So from this we see that there is a declaration of one's iniquity that accompanies this godly sorrow. To declare means to make plain, to make known, or to tell explicitly. So when one is repentant or is truly sorry for his sin, he is then led by the Spirit of God to declare the sin, to make it known or to tell it explicitly. We will touch on who this declaration is to be made to shortly, but this process the Bible calls confession and it always follows genuine repentance. In Psalm 32 verses 5 and 6, we read the words of David. He says, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Here we see David acknowledging his sin in verse 5. There is an acknowledgement of guilt. He takes ownership of the wrong committed. This is an important point for us to note as we must also take ownership of the wrongs we have committed, making no excuses for or any attempt at lessening our guilt. There must be a sincere acknowledgement of our sin. Next we read that he did not seek to hide his iniquity, but that instead he confessed his sins unto the Lord. This is also a very important point to note. Our sins are to be confessed not to an earthly entity, but to God himself, as it is only he that can grant us forgiveness. Both the books of Mark and Luke tells us that it is blasphemy for a man to claim to have the power or the ability to forgive us of our sins, as that is the prerogative of God alone. But not only that, another reason for us directing our confessions to God is that our sins, whatever they may be, are actually against Him. He is the one that is offended or grieved or hurt, and as a result, it is His pardon that we need above all. Our sins are against a very personal God. His heart is pained when we sin, and so our primary thought or primary obligation is to seek His pardon, to acknowledge and to confess our sins to Him. In Psalms 51 verse 3 it reads, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Now that's very interesting. Here we see David acknowledging his sin. He had taken Bathsheba, Uriah's wife, unto himself, and then orchestrated Uriah's death afterward to cover his crime. But in his prayer, he says in verse 4, Against thee, thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight. Now David had most definitely committed a great evil against both Uriah and Bathsheba. But in his prayer, he recognized that above all, his sin was against the God of heaven. We have another example of this in the experience of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. As she attempts to seduce him, we read his words in Genesis chapter 39 and verse 9. He says, There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Now again, had Joseph followed through with his suggestion, he would have committed an evil against Potiphar. But his words emphasized the fact that he understood that should he sin, that ultimately it would be against God. And so our sins, regardless of what they may be, are always, always against God. Now they may affect others negatively as well. Our sins can certainly cause pain or grief or hurt to our fellow men. And when that occurs, we have a corresponding obligation toward them also. 
this will address shortly. But as we mentioned earlier, the reason we go to God with our confessions is because our sins are ultimately against Him. Therefore, we need His pardon, and He alone is qualified to clear us of our guilt. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is His promise to us, and it plainly lays before us our duty if we falter. If we sin, we are to go to God in humility, confess our sins, and the promise is that we will be forgiven. But it is very important for us to understand that confession will not be acceptable to God without sincere repentance and reformation. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And so the forsaking of the sin, and not just the confession of it, is the condition for mercy or forgiveness. Remember that repentance is our first work. We must first be genuinely sorry for our sins, and this sorrow is a godly sorrow, one that inspires a change of action, one that is actuated by a love of God, and one that causes a turning away from sin in the heart. And so attached to the confession of sin is the forsaking of it. To confess a sin only to repeat it a short while after, time and time again, shows a lack of genuine repentance. It shows that there is still an attachment to it in the heart, and it may be, as Christ said, that this kind goeth not out but through prayer and fasting. The plan of salvation was not devised for us to perpetuate a cycle of sinning, repenting, and confessing. Sinning, repenting, and confessing. It was devised to offer the sinner mercy, a period of grace where through the power of God we can be made to reflect His character and gain victory over our besetments. Now we mentioned earlier that when our sins affect our fellow men, we also have a corresponding obligation to them if our confession is to be accepted by God. In James chapter 5 and verse 16 we read, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much. Now notice the word fault is used and not sin. We are to confess our sins to God who alone can forgive them, and our faults one to another. And so if our actions have wronged or injured another individual, it is our duty to acknowledge our wrong and make reconciliation with those we have injured as much as it's in our power to do so. The Bible teaches that this confession of fault, this reconciliation with those whom we have wronged, this clearing of ourselves, must happen if we are to be accepted of God. And what you would find is that a lot of times this will prove to be a very trying experience trying in the humility that it demands. But this humiliation, this letting go of pride, this sincere acknowledging of guilt before your fellow man, is just what the heart needs as a preparation of sorts to approach God in the true spirit of confession. In the book of Matthew, chapter 5 and verse 23, we continue, Therefore if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother had aught against thee, Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. And so in this instance, you remember that someone has ought against you. You are the innocent party, but instead of waiting for them to humble themselves and come to you to apologize or make reconciliation, the Bible is plain that before you, the innocent party, can offer your petition or gift before the Lord, it is your duty to go and first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Now this may be a very hard saying for some, but an attempt to reconcile or settle any pending grievance with our fellow men, regardless of who is in the wrong, must be made before our confession will be acceptable in God's sight. All this will testify to the Spirit leading us in our repentance and confession. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12, we read the words of the Lord's Prayer. It says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Here Christ teaches us a valuable lesson, that we will receive forgiveness just in proportion to the forgiveness that we grant to others. And so as you are about to approach God in confession, 
or even as you listen to the words of this video. If there is someone you have wronged or who has been injured by your actions, make reconciliation as much as it's in your power to do so. If there is someone that has injured you or has done you a great evil and you are withholding forgiveness from them, seek to make reconciliation in the Spirit of Christ and forgive them in the same manner that you desire forgiveness from the God of Heaven. This is necessary if our confession is to be accepted by God. So now we want to return to Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13. We mentioned the latter portion of the verse. Now we want to focus on the beginning of the verse. And it reads, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. And in the book of Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 1, it says, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel but not of me, and that cover with a covering but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. Now so many times when we are confessing our sins to God, or our faults to men. We seek to cover or to make excuses for our sins in an attempt to lessen our guilt. For this the Bible condemns and when we do it, we testify to the fact that our confession is of a different spirit to that of Christ's. We have an example of this in the Garden of Eden. When Adam was confronted for his sin, his response was, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And Eve responded in a similar manner. She said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Now both acknowledged that they ate the fruit, but they both deferred their guilt to another. Something or someone else was responsible for their sin. They failed to take ownership of their wrongdoing. Confessions of this order is not acceptable to God. No one but ourselves is responsible for our sin, and we must take ownership of that if our confessions are to be accepted by God. A more subtle example of this is when we know we have erred and are attempting to make reconciliation with our fellow men. The simple inclusion of the word if, if I have wronged you, when you know for a certainty that you have, is an attempt to lessen your guilt by feigning ignorance, by claiming to be unaware. Again, it is a failure to take ownership. All of these and many others are ways we seek to evade the humiliation of true confession. But if we never truly confess, we will never truly receive pardon. Our sins remain upon us, covered with a covering but not of God's Spirit, and as a result we add sin to sin. True confession, however, is always of a specific character. It is not made in a flippant or careless manner. It is heartfelt and freely expressed. It is never urged from the sinner. It may be of such a nature as to be brought before God alone, or it may be wrongs that should be confessed to individuals who have suffered injury through your sinful course of action toward them. Or finally, they may be of a public character and as a result should be publicly confessed. But whatever the case may be, all confession should be definite and to the point, acknowledging the very sins of which you are guilty without excuses or hypocrisy. I pray that we will partake of the true spirit of confession, fulfill our duty to God and to our fellow men, and receive the blessing of forgiveness. In our next video, we will look into what is to happen after we have confessed our sins. Take care.